We're back from our break. I'm here with Dr. David Menton, and we're talking about the seeing eye and the marvel and the complexity of how the eye is made. What is it about the eye that makes the evolutionists say that it's uh, poorly designed or poorly engineered? Uh, it seems to work so beautifully to me, I can't understand what they're complaining about. Help me understand. Really, the feature that they touch on as being evidence of, of poor construction uh, is the retina. Okay. Uh, the retina is down uh, here in this area, and we could think of it as being like the film in a camera. Okay. And uh, the light comes through and uh, hits this uh, film. Now, I don't know if you ever worked with one of these cameras that shoot sheet film, but if you put the film in upside down, like the old view cameras, so the film is in backwards, you get no pictures. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what the evolutionist is basically saying here is that the film in the camera, which is the retina, the light-sensitive part of an eye, a little thin sheet, thinner than tissue paper, that it's in there upside down. And what exactly do they mean by being upside down? Let's uh, look at uh, one little uh, part uh, of the retina. Uh, we'll take a section about where you see that box there and magnify that. And this is a picture in the microscope of a cross-section of the retina. So it's very thin, but it looks thick here after we magnify it several hundred times. And we notice that the retina has a number of cells in it. These are ganglion cells from the brain. Uh, so the eye is really part of the brain. Huh. It buds off the brain. And here are ganglion cells that are the types of cells we would see in the brain. The light-sensitive cells that are actually responding to the light light comes down from the top like this and has to go all the way down to here before it hits the light sensitive part of the retina. These are the photoreceptors. There's about 120 million of these in the eye and instead of facing up, <laughs> they face down, away from the light. Thanks. Doesn't seem like the right way to make it. You know, evolutionists have told us that without evolution nothing in biology really makes any sense. Well, here's a case where with evolution uh, this piece of biology is not going to make sense. And uh, what they've argued is the retina really ought to be the other way around to take these light-sensitive cells and bring them up to the surface here. Now, that's the way it is in an octopus. Oh. They have the retina right side up. But all vertebrates, animals with bones, have it upside down. So take an eagle. The retina would be upside down. Okay. Well, does the eagle see pretty well? After all, we use the expression eagle-eyed. <laughs> They always catch more fish than I do. That's right. And you know why they catch more fish now? They see it's better. It's been said that when they're up on a tree along the river, they can see a fish just under the surface of the water up to a mile away. Wow. I got a feeling if you put an octopus up in the tree, he wouldn't see anything. <laughs> I got a feeling. <laughs> of course, maybe the eagle wouldn't be that good underwater. So yeah. I think each one is optimally designed for its own purpose. Uh, why is this a, a bad idea to bring these cells up here? Well, it turns out that, first of all, the retina works beautifully just the way it is. Our retina is sensitive to a single photon of light. That's the smallest quantity of light we have. Wow. In addition to that, the, the resolution of the retina, in other words, the sharpness of the picture, is better than the lens and the cornea can produce. So we say it's a refraction-limited system. It's a system limited by its optics, not by its film. Wow. More importantly, these photoreceptors have to be very, very close to the blood supply. And the blood vessels are down here. Uh -huh. And it's the most richly uh, supplied uh, system in the body in terms of blood. You could think of it as like a solid lake of blood down here. And if you brought these photoreceptors to the top, you'd have to put all of this blood <laughs> on the top. You couldn't see through it. So it's really pretty optimum uh, just the way it's put together. You know, there really is a sandwich of blood vessels. We have, a, we have a layer of blood vessels up here that you see here in the picture. And then we have this really elaborate supply of blood down here. And here's the retina in between. But the blood vessels that are on top of the retina are nowhere near as extensive as the ones that are on the bottom. And we do have to look through those. And that's rather like looking through a uh, plate of spaghetti. Yeah. Uh, if we... You ever wonder when uh, the ophthalmologist looks in your eye with the little scope, right. what, he, what he's seeing in there? Possibly old movies or something? This is the picture through the ophthalmoscope. And these are the retinal vessels that are on top of the retina. 
which are not as numerous as the ones right. underneath. And we have to filter those out so we don't see them. Otherwise, they'd be in our visual uh, field. And the mechanism of filtering those out are just, is just amazing. It turns out the eyeball, because of its muscles, is caused to tremor at a high frequency. And this tremoring causes the retina to move like so. Now, the blood vessels in the retina move with the retina as the eyeball tremors. The brain has a little rule that says, if it doesn't move, ignore it. So the shadow of the retinal blood vessels that you see here doesn't move as the eye moves, but the movement of the eye causes everything we look at to be moving. So that if I'm looking at a uh, tree, the tree is moving on my retina. And thus we see the tree, but we don't see the blood vessels because they're moving with the retina. Now, what about the muscles that move the eye? Uh, there is a muscle on top of the eyeball and one on the bottom, and of course that moves the eyeball up and down. There's one towards the nose and one away from the nose. That moves it left and right like a horse's head. On a mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, oh, my favorite muscles. There are two more, so there's not just four in each eyeball. There's one on the top, one on the bottom, and they go crossways. And when these muscles contract, our eyeballs actually do this. They turn left and right. Ah. Now, why on earth do we have muscles that do that? This is so neat. It turns out that when we walk, we kind of tilt from side to side like this. And it's very important that our horizon not be going. We get dizzy, fall down. Yeah. And so as our head tilts from side to side, the eyeballs rotate to keep the horizon level. And this muscle, by the way, is just spectacular. It has to go through a pulley, a lubricated pulley, in order to contract and pull around the corners, the muscle goes right down into the orbit of the eye, comes out to the edge, and goes across. So, uh, most remarkable. That is absolutely incredible, the intricacy of that. Muscles show. of our eyes. Well, probably uh, a good place to kind of bring things to a conclusion here is the eyelid. Uh, the eyelid uh, distributes water and fluids over the surface of our eye to clean the eye, much like window wipers would clean the window of a house. The fluid flows from out here at the edge of our eye across to our nose. And when it gets to the nose, there are two little holes. I think you can see them here. There's one little hole here. Yeah. And there's one little hole here. And these two little holes, called puncta, suck the water off the eye to keep the flow going across the eye. And the pH of this water, and there's special proteins to kill bacteria and what have you in the water, and the level in your window washers are automatically maintained. <laughs> Would it be terrible if we had to go check the window washers in our <laughs> eye? And when you get the fluid to come across the eye like this, it just keeps coming across, you have a little oil dam around the edge that keeps the fluid from breaking over the edge, so it forms a surface. In fact, it's a water layer on our eye that forms the optical surface. It's much smoother than if you just had the cornea. Mm -hmm. That's kind of rough. So this film of water is optically important. But of course, as we tear up, the layer can get quite thick. And if the layer gets thick, we get bleary eye, don't we? <laughs> And uh, so we have uh, a system that is constantly removing the water, trying to stay ahead of it. Here's the tear gland here. And uh, over here, we have the little pumps that pump the water off the eye. The water comes off and goes into this little duct system down into the nose. That's why you get the sniffles when you cry. into the nose, yeah. Uh, if the tear fluid builds up too much, uh, the tear fluid can finally break over this oil dam and uh, we cry. come down the cheek in the form of tears. And, uh, you know, I think that's a, a good note to conclude on because the Bible even has something to tell us about tears. It tells us, for example, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, 
for the former things that passed away. Dr. Menton, you've done us a great service today, and it's oh, great to you. have you with us, seeing the intricacy of the eye and the, and the marvel that it makes. And friends, I just want to thank you for being with us. You know, our bodies are so incredibly made that they had to have a maker. You know, if you have questions about something that Dr. Minton has said, or if you have suggestions for us here at Origins, write to me at Origins, Cornerstone Television, Wall, PA, 15148.